Yeah, that's my sermon. Um, so far, I've been going through different prophecies um, through Advent, and each of these prophecies that, were, that are about the coming Messiah are also directly uh, about, in some which way, shape, or form, the Advent ca candle for that day. So the first week, I did a prophecy that had to do with hope. The second uh, week, I did a prophecy that had to do with peace. And this week, I'm doing a prophecy that has to do with joy, which is uh, Isaiah chapter 9. But what's interesting about Isaiah chapter 9 is that last week's uh, passage is actually quite relevant for this week's passage. If you may recall, last week, uh, we talked about Isaiah 7. You know, and a lot of Old Testament uh, prophecies are only about a chapter long, some are even shorter, but there are a few that are longer. And this is actually one of them. Isaiah 7 through 9, or at least halfway through 9, constitute a section, constitute a whole unit. Um, and we can tell this because the different little sections, different little logical parts, begin with words such as because, or for, or nevertheless, or moreover, depending on your translation. You know, and this tells us that these things are connected. There's a logical order and flow to them. Uh, and that means that chapter 9 has assumed that you've read chapter 7, and also has assumed that you've read chapter 8. And let me remind you, chapter 7 is a chapter where Isaiah um, introduces the name Emmanuel, God with us, and that a child will be born to a virgin, and that child's name shall be Emmanuel, and that child shall judge the nations and bring peace to his people. Now, and that was specifically also having to do with Judah and Syria, but it also expanded beyond that and included all of God's people, um, and protecting them from all of the disaster of the foreign nations. Now, chapter 8 continues in the themes of chapter 7. Uh, Emmanuel comes and judges the, judges the nations. Uh, Israel itself is punished for its sins. And also, that our loyalty ought to be to God first and not to the corrupt kings of Judah and Israel. And also, not necessarily the corrupt kings that may come in our own nation, America, that he rise up. But in chapter 9, there's a major shift. So up until this point, he's talking about peace for Judah and punishment on Syria and Israel. And in chapter 9, it reads, starting in verse, verse 1, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And afterward, more heavily oppressed her, for by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in the Gal in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shone. Now, two names are brought up, Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, who are, who are Zebulun and Naphtali? What, what, what are those names? Are those nations? What are they? Well, they are actually tribes. They are tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Zebulun and Naphtali are some of the northernmost tribes of all of Israel. You know, and um, thus, they are actually a part of the northern kingdom of Israel. They're not part of Judah. So up until this point, Isaiah has been condemning Israel and, thus, and saying that he will protect Judah. But now he's turning his attention to Israel and saying that blessing shall come to Israel. You know, now it is important that he isn't speaking this directly to the capital of Israel, which would be Ephraim and Samaria, but rather he's speaking instead to these northern tribes all the way up north, where actually the most, um, where the largest group of Gentiles actually live in and among the, the uh, Israelites. It is also worth noting that right at the border of Naphtali and Zebulun, there is actually a small little village that is worth remembering. Um, you've probably heard of it. This village is called Nazareth. 
prophecy is talking about, the area in and around Nazareth. In fact, this is why Matthew quotes this very passage in chapter 4, when Jesus is starting his ministry. So, what does Isaiah therefore declare for Israel? What does Isaiah declare for Naphtali and Zebul? Well, he declares joy. Uh, in, chapter, in verse 3, it, it reads, And you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of the harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Think, if you will, that there was a man, and this man had two sons, and he loved both of his sons. And at one point, one of those sons despised his father, spat in his face, and said, I want nothing to do with you, and leaves. While the other son remains. Now, first, that father would turn to the son that remained and speak to him words of blessing, and say, I will take care of you, and I will lift you up. But we know, and we know from the words of Jesus, that that same father, at the earliest possible degree, would take that other son and embrace him back and declare him as his own if that son repents. And here, Israel and Judah are those two sons. Israel has rebelled, has become a prodigal son of God, while Judah has remained with the Lord. And therefore, God has spoke first blessings to Judah, but he has not forgotten his other son. He has not forgotten Israel, and his heart is still for his people. His heart is still that those who belong to him in the northern kingdom would still be his, and that he would reclaim them. And that is fundamentally what this passage is about. That one day, God will reclaim his people from the northern kingdom. See, while Isaiah said says he will not abandon Judah, he, now in Isaiah 9, he will not abandon Israel. Israel shall be restored. But what's also interesting is that he mentions another group. Right here in, in verse 2, it says, in Galilee of the Gentiles. Because there's a large group of Gentiles that are living right in the midst of Naphtali, that area of the Galilee. And he also says that blessing shall come to them as well. So it's not just that blessing will come to Judah, and it's not just that blessing will come to Judah and to Israel, but that blessing shall also come to the Gentiles. And the reason is, is because if you go all the way back to Adam and Eve, and every single one of us, just a small number. He wants us all because he loves us all. God's love and joy is for all of his children. And he wants to bring us prosperity. He wants to bring us blessing. He wants to lift us up so that we can live joyful lives. What parent doesn't live to see a smile on their child's face? What parent doesn't live to see their children running around full of joy? And God is also such a parent. He wants to see us living in joy, loving each other, taking care of each other, um, living together in harmony. Not because we're under oppression, but because we want to be there. That we are just full 
and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, I have to admit that I probably spent a little bit more time uh, in writing this sermon on that one verse than I probably needed to, because I was... Uh, I was looking at the Hebrew and I probably spent a good hour just reading it over and over again. It is so beautiful, um, the way it says, and, and all these names. Um, and it is wonderful, it's not wonderful counselor, it is wonderful counselor. And the point is that it's calling back to what? To Isaiah 7, what we read last week. When he said that a child shall be born of a virgin, and that his name shall be Emmanuel. Now that same child is being referenced again. That child shall be born, and shall be born for us. That that son will be given for us. And that he will have a second name. And that second name is really, really long. And that second name is wonderful, counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom, love that one. You know, and God has sent Jesus Christ to bring all the peoples of the world together to make all of the peoples of the world his family so that none of us are left behind. This child will not just simply be born, but will take up the throne of David. It says, the increase of his government and peace, and there will be no end. For upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order an establishment with judgment and with justice, from that time forward and even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is the child who was born. This is Emmanuel. This is wonderful. This is counsel. This is mighty God, Prince of Peace, everlasting Father. This is who he is. That he is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And we get to live in the knowledge of who he is and what he has already done. We get to live in the peace that those in the Old Testament times were looking forward to in only hope. And now we live in the intermediate where the hope has already been partially delivered and there is still more to come. Hallelujah. So this is the child that has taken up the throne of David. And he will bring peace. He will bring peace to Judah. He will bring peace to Israel. And he will bring peace to us, the Gentiles. Let us pray. Jesus, it is so hard to think of you sometimes as a baby, to think of you as an infant. But still, you came to the earth to be one of us, to experience life as, you've, as we experience it. To not just simply be aloof, but to be right here alongside of us, so that we may know that you know what it is that we're going through. We pray, O Lord, we will never ever forget who it is that you are, and that we will be part of your family, and that while being part of this family, we may run around with joyful faces, laughing, singing, and declaring the praises of God our Father.